Hi Geography students, it's Mrs. T. And today is the first short discussion we're going to have together about the development chapter in our cultural geography book. Uh, it's got a different number with it depending upon what edition of the textbook you're using. Um, any of the most recent three editions of the textbook will work because we're going to look at some general um, terminology for cultural geographers rather than the specific examples that the textbook uses. All of those examples are great, but each edition of the textbook has um, a different example just for the different political times and the different social times that the textbook was published during, during which the textbook was published. Pardon me for my improper sentence structure there. We don't want the English teachers to be fussing at cultural geographers for modeling improper English patterns. So let me fix my, uh, my English there. Okay, so in this unit in, uh, of development, it's a really, really interesting unit, but I have to say that I have a little bit of personal internal struggle with the development topics, industrialization topics, urbanization, that kind of thing, with cultural geography, simply because um, development is such a key component, a key factor in determining wealth and style of life for people within a nation in the world. And it sort of um, disregards traditional forms of economic participation in the economy, such as horticulture or uh, subsistence agriculture and that kind of thing that we learned about way early in this semester. So, um, so this development chapter has a lot of capitalism industrialization good, capitalism industrialization bad kind of back and forth banter about um, the way we rank nations in comparison to each other around the world. So global stratification is the overarching theme for um, this particular discussion on development and industrialization in uh, cultural geography. So stratification is our word that immediately should make you think of inequality as the topic. Stratification is something that we can use when we're talking about race, ethnicity, sex, gender, cultural identity within the landscape on a micro scale, but also stratification is a term that's used on the global scale when comparing countries of the world to each other. And that's a major thing that we are going to focus on when we discuss development in, um, in cultural geography class. So global stratification is ranking or the degree, the degree, pardon me, of inequality between or among the nations of the world. So you've probably heard of the first world, second world, third world approach to categorizing nations in comparison to each other. That has to do with the degree of development. There's another one, two, three ranking that we also hear very often in news media and history books and economics books, and it's the levels of development approach to global stratification, where literally you use the word developed like past tense, industrialization happened, it's full force, developing, which means present tense and ongoing. Industrialization is occurring, but it's not as mature as it could be, and therefore its progress is still being made, and underdeveloped nations. So that's where industrialization has either not taken place or it only has occurred in the private sector, or there's a lot of perhaps corruption in the government that prevents the people within a nation from actually enjoying the fruits of industry, the fruits that industry can provide to the people of nations when people of goodwill are running the corporations, running the government, and that kind of thing. But it's um, there's, there's my uh, 
part of my pet peeve about this is um, some of the potential for development, some of the potential of industrialization throughout the world um, is tapped only by those who wish to keep it for themselves rather than spreading the uh, benefits I'm not saying wealth, but spreading the benefits of um, industrialization and development to all of the citizens of a country that you are using to boost yourself. So, and I say yourself because um, typically we use particular um, classifications to measure development within a nation and among nations of the world. Those uh, words are, um, listed in the first couple of pages of your development chapter. I'm referring to concepts called gross national product, gross domestic product, gross national income. These concepts, we usually don't refer to them by saying out their long name. We would say GNP, GDP, GNI would be the way that we would refer to this in writing. We would introduce it first. Um, you know, the first way we would introduce it uh, is by saying it out and then GDP, G. Uh, NP and GNI is how you would refer to it. Uh, gross national product, gross domestic product, gross national income. So they have some different ways of measuring those to help us figure out how do nations rank in comparison to each other throughout the world. In uh, some behavioral social sciences, instead of looking at first world, second world, third world and developing a nation's approach, you look at a levels of income approach to global stratification, where you rank nations of the world in comparison to each other, but it's not so much based on the GDP, GNP, and GNI. Instead, it's based on the style of life of the citizens within that, cult, within that country, the degrees of wealth or poverty that the citizenship shares and has advantages of in their daily life. And that's where industrialization and development kind of overlap. Because in the United States, for instance, which would be considered a high income nation, we have a high GNP, a high GDP, and a high GNI. Those monies that are produced, and, and I'll go over those um, uh, in a different video or at least in a little statement in your folder in Blackboard to explain them more thoroughly. But in the United States, we have high scores in all of those rankings, the GDP, GNI, and GNP. Uh, Is that the one I left out? So we have very high rank in um, all of those scores. And that's because of our degree of industrialization, but it is also our degree, it's, it's also because of the degree to which we reinvest that income from industrialization into the infrastructure that we have, the sewer systems, the road systems, the airports, the transportation systems, telecommunications, satellites, these kinds of things that boost our style of life, our standard of living within our nation. We have cell towers, we have landlines, we have electrical cables, we have satellite internet, we have all of these kinds of things available to us for a price. However, even if you do not purchase a satellite internet, for instance, like I have to out in my rural location, I can travel from my home to a place that provides it, such as the central library system or even McDonald's, and use Wi-Fi that is provided um, sort of free of charge. It's really through, um, through tax funding or through um, services that a, a for-profit business like McDonald's provides as an incentive for you to spend time and buy things in their restaurant. So those kinds of things are available to you and me readily. We often take them for granted. In other countries that would be classified as developing or underdeveloped, second world or third world, or low income nations, the style of life does not include proper sanitation, for instance, like we've covered in some of our discussions so far. Um, you and I take for granted that our trash is carried away from our homes and stored in a sanitary way that prevents disease from spreading through the refuse that people dispose of. 
we have sewer systems and we have septic systems and we have water treatment plants that work for the benefit of public health and those kinds of things we don't feel in our pocketbook necessarily because they're paid for through um, tax money, through fees, through um, uh, tariffs, through uh, duties and those kinds of things that industrialization in our type of social system and our type of government that tries to foster goodwill. Do you hear my cynicism there just a bit? But in our government system that is supposedly based on goodwill and benefit of life, liberty, and property for all, um, we do see significant reinvestment of those taxes, those fees, those tariffs, um, those things into roads, into proper sanitation, into the electrical grid, and that kind of thing. So we have a greatly improved style of life than they do, for instance, in certain African nations. Uh, and this is, I'm remembering now that you are going to be watching a documentary um, about p the style of life of certain people in Switzerland, a very, very uh, wealthy nation in Europe that has corporations that are centered out of um, Switzerland, but that use the resources in various countries of Africa to really increase the Swiss gross national product. Now, the gross national product, I'll go ahead and outline what that means, GNP. This is the sum total of all of the uh, revenue, all of the money that is generated by the citizens of a particular nation. However, the word citizen is defined very loosely. You might have heard that corporations are defined as citizens and the personal civil code and civil law usually applies to a corporation. So if a corporation has its headquarters in a nation, in a town, that corporation is technically measured as a person. And so whatever profit that, per that corporation makes is considered part of the income that people in that town make. It's used in the average of what is the average income of um, that particular nation uh, for the people who uh, reside in it. So that it's factored in there. So in gross national product, if you have a company that is headquartered in Switzerland, but the profit that you are generating through that corporation depends greatly on a variety of countries in Africa or the Middle East or South America or wherever your industry is focused, the money that's generated does not go toward the gross national product of Zambia, for instance. It goes toward the gross national product of the country where the, the corporation is headquartered. So there are some problems, in other words, with this levels of development um, measurement because uh, sometimes the, in, the degree of industrialization in a place, if you are mining copper, for instance, or rare earth minerals in China, for instance, you need a high level of industrialized machinery, trained workers to operate that machinery, processes to refine elements out of what you have, uh, out of the ore that you have collected from the earth, if that's the kind of mine that you're involved in. So you need a high level of industrialization and it might be located in Western Sahara in Africa, um, just to use a random example. But that industrialized process, that, that degree of industrialization does not count for Western Sahara in Africa if that money does not stay within the borders, if the money goes on the balance sheet of a company outside those borders. So um, I will stop the video right now because I want to make sure that all of these are very um, short and I will regroup and uh, give you some more information in just a second. And this is the first installment of our discussion about development. It's all about social inequality on the global scale and industrialization. So we're combining really the development and industrialization chapters at the same time. So I will see you again very soon. Bye.